In Calgary, Alberta, Pacific Western Airlines Flight 314 is ready for takeoff. It is just a short hop to Cranbrook, BC, but for most of the crew and passengers on board, it will be their final journey. Calgary Airport, Saturday, February 11, 1978. For 19-year-old college student David White, it has been one of those mornings. His alarm didn't go off, and he is just minutes away from missing his flight to the annual Winterfest celebrations in nearby Kimberley. I was late all the way to the airport. Uh, I was stopped. I was stopped by a train on Blackfoot Trail. The faster I tried to go, the slower I seemed to move. He is booked on Pacific Western Flight 314, bound for his hometown of Cranbrook, British Columbia. I remember running like crazy to try to get to the plane, and they were just pulling the stairs up when I got there and lowered them down again, and then I got onto the plane. There was an empty seat right at the very back, and that's the one I took. There are now 43 passengers on board and five crew members. Most of the passengers on Flight 314 are from the Cranbrook area. Friends Ron Sims and Robbie McCrimmon are partners in a successful plumbing and heating business in Cranbrook. We just built a new shop. It was, uh, it was going good. We were, we were very busy and it was a good time of my life, really. Ron and Robbie have been in Calgary going over designs for an office building they are working on. We worked with the engineer in Calgary all day of the 10th, and we were supposed to fly back home to Cranbrook on, uh, uh, it would have been Friday, and we weren't quite finished. So we had to cancel the flight. We took the, the next flight out, which was the flight uh, coming to Cranbrook on February the 11th. We picked our own seat. We sat at the beginning of the smoking section, as my friend smoked. Otherwise, we would have been sitting close to the front. 59-year-old Peter Miskow is a recently retired miner returning home after his first vacation since the death of his wife. A persistent case of gout has forced him to cut short his stay in Calgary. He had been in Las Vegas. He was supposed to go to a party in Calgary Saturday night. His toe was bothering him. He just wanted to come home. Flight attendant Gail Bunn is working the rear of the plane today. Her colleagues, Patty Wong and Cindy Jean Wolf, are working the front. It is 12.29 p.m. In the cockpit, Captain Chris Miles and First Officer Peter Van Oort prepare for takeoff. The 30-year-old pilot has been flying for 11 years and knows his way around a 737. Despite reported snowfall in the Cranbrook area, he is looking forward to a routine flight. Well, Flight 314 on that day was uh, leaving Calgary, um, stopping at Cranbrook, then carrying on west uh, to the Okanagan. It left uh, Calgary Airport at uh, 12.30 hours, and shortly after that, at about uh, 12.33, the uh, Calgary Control Tower phoned the air radio operator at the Cranbrook Airport and advised them the flight had taken off and gave them what's called an ETA, that's Estimated Time of Arrival. The ETA they cited was 13.05 hours, which was 35 minutes later. The calculation made by Calgary Tower is based on a regular flight path over the Rocky Mountains and into the Kootenay Valley situated in the southeast corner of British Columbia. Here, flights link up with a radio beacon originating near the village of Skukumchuk, which leads them straight south into Cranbrook Airport. Uh, a beacon is uh, simply a piece of equipment uh, that sends out a signal, and the uh, uh, navigational equipment in the aircraft directs the plane to that beacon. It's, it's following the sound, so it's very, very precise. If you take all the flights from Calgary to Cranbrook, they average out about 25 minutes. 
But in bad weather, if they're coming over the beacon on an instrument approach, they do a sort of a circle around the beacon before heading south. And that adds that extra eight minutes or so to the flight. And so when the flight time was calculated by the people in Calgary, they would probably calculate the maximum time. The flight's destination is a bustling community of 15,000, nestled in the beautiful Kootenay Valley on the western fringe of the Rocky Mountains. It is known for having the most sunlight of any area in the province, but not on this particular Saturday. The weather in Cranbrook has definitely been touch and go all morning. But for residents such as professional photographer Brian Clarkson, it's not unusual for February. It was quite slow that day, business-wise, because of the weather. It was snowing very heavily. I remember that because I had to shovel the sidewalk in front of our business and uh, had to shovel it several times that day. Firefighter Stuart Miskow is at home in nearby Kimberley, enjoying his Saturday off. The fact that his father is arriving on a flight from Calgary in less than an hour has completely slipped his mind. By 12.30 p.m., it is still snowing, and visibility at Cranbrook Airport is just over one kilometer. There is only one runway, just 1,800 meters long, but there is plenty of clear airspace between the mountain ranges. In fact, the strip is considered one of the safest in the BC interior. Equipment operator Terry George has been out most of the morning, trying to keep the runway clear. He uses a two-way radio to keep tabs on estimated arrival times. They have a snow plow out on the runway right to the last minute, keeping the runway as clean as possible to facilitate the landing. As soon as the ETA is given from Calgary to Cranbrook operator, the operator there radios him and gives him the ETA. So the snowplow operator assumes that the aircraft will come in at 1305 and he'll stay out there keeping that runway as clean as possible as long as possible. It is 12.42 p.m. In the cockpit, Captain Chris Miles and First Officer Peter Van Oort are preparing for their descent into Cranbrook. So the aircraft control of Calgary would call, call the flight and um, gave them permission to switch frequencies from the Calgary Tower to the Cranbrook Airport. Uh, Flight 314 then contacts the Cranbrook radio operator uh, throughout their approach and right after and asking for what they call the numbers and that is the local conditions. But interestingly at that time neither the airport radio operator or the pilot ever gave each other an ETA. So the actual ETA that the pilot was operating on was not shared with the people on the ground. And they were still operating on the ETA given from the Calgary Tower operator, which it turns out was 10 minutes out. Calgary's ETA is 10 minutes out because pilot Chris Miles has chosen not to do a customary circle around the Skookumchuck Beacon before heading south. He took a direct in approach, came over the beacon and flew directly in along, the, along the beacon right into the airport. About 12.46, the uh, air radio operator in Kravik called 314 again and updated their visibility, again repeating it was three quarters of a mile visibility in snow, and also the snow plow was out on the runway still clearing snow. And right after that, Flight 314 acknowledged receiving that report. Later reports indicated that when the air radio operator said there's a plow on the runway, there is some evidence that the pilot did not hear that. It is 12.55 p.m. On board Flight 314, David White is still seated at the rear of the plane, with only flight attendant Gail Bunn in the jump seat behind him. And then we came into land and uh, it was snowing, it was gray. I never really was aware that there was something wrong. He never knew about a crash. Saturday, February 11th, 1978, 12.55 p.m. 
At Cranbrook Airport, equipment operator Terry George is halfway up the runway, clearing snow in preparation for flight 314 from Calgary. Estimated time of arrival is 105, which gives him at least five minutes before he has to move off. In the cockpit, pilot Chris Miles brings the 737 in for a landing, easing the throttle to idle and reducing power to the engines. Just as the plane touches down, he initiates the aircraft's thrust reverse system. The thrust reversers are really a system for braking the aircraft, or slowing it down. It takes just two seconds for the reverse thrusters to deploy as they should, but there is nothing routine about the landing. It was very, very hard when we hit the, hit the tarmac. It was, it was quite a jolt, actually. I put it up because the weather was so bad, and that's the only reason. But the weather is not the problem. Just as he touches down, pilot Chris Miles sees the snowplow through the haze of snow in front of him. He touched down at just under 1,000 feet along the runway, and the snowplow is at 2,000 foot mark. So there's only 1,000 feet, which is not much when the aircraft is landing over 100 miles an hour. So then he would have to immediately initiate uh, maneuver to take off again. So he closed the thrust reversers, slammed the throttles as far ahead as they'd go. The thrust reversers started to close back to their normal position just as the plane took off again. That's when things really went haywire. For Terry George, the 737 is in the air just in time. When it passes over the snowplow, it is only 18 meters above the ground. About six seconds later, the one on the left, the port uh, engine, the, the reverses are starting to open. They're blown open by the wind. It is a deadly situation. With one engine in full forward throttle and the other braking in reverse thrust, the plane is impossible to fly. It was just great because the plane had banged hard to the left, which meant I was looking up and out of the window. So it was, it was just great, you couldn't see anything. The pilots have one more chance, a manual override switch that will close the left reverse thrust doors. So he took off his seat belt and he stood up and he was able to flip open the cap and tried to hit the switch, but he missed it. You know, you can't imagine the terror. I'm, I'm sure that as pilots, they knew what was almost inevitable, but yet they tried everything they possibly could. In its final moments, the 737 rolls to the left in a spinning cartwheel. It has been just 10 seconds since the aborted landing. That's a lot, one of the last things I remember hearing is the, the stewardess says, oh, we're gonna crash tonight. I just thought, no, I don't think so, not in 737. I flew forward and, and uh, without a seatbelt, I would have just been launched. So it kept me in there, but I, it just about ripped me in half. The left wing and nose hit together uh, in a very steep approach, and the aircraft essentially broke into three pieces. Miraculously, some of those in the tail section have survived the impact. It was just, a, just like watching a black and white movie. It was just, everything was, there was no color. You just look out the end of the plane that was on fire. There was a ring of fire on the outside of it where it was where it busted off. And... David White heads for the only available exit, the rear emergency door, which flight attendant Gail Bunn is struggling to open. I always thought that it could blow up again, so I got out as quick as I could and I and drug her with me and we both left the plane. Cranbrook, BC, February 11th, 1978. Immediately following the crash, airport personnel alerts police and rescue services in Cranbrook and nearby Kimberley. 
it is quickly clear to Cranbrook residents that something terrible has happened. And the people that were coming into the store were, everybody was commenting, you know, something bad must have happened, something was, was going on. And uh, a few moments later, the phone rang. So a good friend had called to say, uh, you know, get your camera ready. He said a, a 737 has gone down off the end of the runway. We didn't know um, for a couple of hours, we didn't know the extent of the crash. Equipment operator Terry George and firefighter George Grimstead are the first to reach the scene. And so they had to get out foot and flown through this boat to that uh, rear section and then help evacuate the team. One rescuer spots something moving in the wreckage, a piece of dark cloth from the sleeve of a shirt. It is Ron Sims, barely alive. When the plane did crash, nobody survived sitting in front of me. Everybody that survived was sitting behind me. Both my, uh, my legs were burnt right off. Unfortunately, Ron's friend and business partner, Robbie McCrimmon, who was in the seat beside him, is among the dead. One of those at the scene is Kimberly firefighter Stuart Miskow, but his reasons for being there are strictly personal. When I was at the station, my chief said to me, he says, isn't your dad on this flight? I just wasn't thinking about it at the time. And, you know, and all of a sudden when the chief said it, I went, oh yeah, you know, and then it dawned on me. When I approached the scene, I could see fire guys working in the cockpit through the windows, uh, trying to get, get in there. And there was bodies laying, helter-skelter all over the place. And I walked over towards the tail section. I looked down, and there was my dad. He was just, you know, just sitting there, just calm, kind of like, just, just a look on his face like he'd been looking out the window or something, you know? Yeah, there was no look of terror on him or anything. So what I did was I, uh, I proceeded over to one of the RCMP officers and I said, I want to identify my father. Very quickly, the town of Cranbrook becomes the focus of media attention across the country and around the world. But even those who come to report on the tragedy can't help but be moved emotionally. Uh, the next day, uh, we were escorted out to the uh, crash site. Uh, all of the bodies except the uh, two pilots had been removed from the wreckage. And, uh, and we walked around and it was just a, a very devastating scene. With the exception of the tail section and the very front of the aircraft, um, I don't think you could determine what it was that was laying in the snow. It was just large pieces of wreckage. It's a gut-wrenching thing to have to do, although uh, that's what you go for. Uh, walking through the wreckage the morning after the crash, uh, it's just something you can't explain. It. There were some very good people on that plane. And uh, yeah, they just think in the, uh, the twinkle of an instant, it was, they were gone. In the end, there are only five survivors. The crash claims 43 lives, and in the days that follow, many are quick to blame snowplow operator Terry George for their deaths. I phoned Terry as soon as I got home from the hospital in Calgary, and I told him, Terry, please don't, don't carry this with you, pal, because it was not your fault. You know, I was the most severely injured survivor, and uh, I, I cer certainly don't blame Terry for anything. I truly believe to this day it wasn't his fault because I, the plane was coming 10 minutes early. And if, if they'd known he was 10 minutes early, they would have told him he'd have been off that runway. Ultimately, the investigation by Transport Canada agrees. It places blame on the flight crew for not reporting to Cranbrook Airport during their final approach and on the construction of the 737, 
which allowed the thrust reverser doors to deploy in flight. The communications problems obviously set the stage for the accident. And then the design of the thrust reverser concluded it. And the factors regarding the design of that thrust reverser at the time would have been the factor if they had been communicating properly. Immediately following the investigation, Transport Canada makes it mandatory for pilots on final approach to uncontrolled airports to provide an estimated time of arrival. Despite positive changes for the future, Cranbrook is left with the tragic memory of 10 seconds that changed many lives forever. I miss him. I wish he had had a little more life before he left, you know, because he worked all his life and he was finally retired and didn't last very long. For whatever reason, uh, every time I, I go out to the airport, Without exception, I will stop and look down to that part of the runway. Um, it's always there, it always will be. I was just, I guess, happy when I opened my eyes and I was still alive. That was uh, one of the best moments of my life. I've had challenges with but but uh, I'm lucky to be able to have a chance to have a challenge or to do things.